So let's start. Uh, welcome to the talk Open WRT versus the FCC Forced Firmware Lockdown. Um, that's kind of a grammatic title, but we will see if it's that bad or not. Uh, I'm Simon Wunderlich. I'm working as a kernel hacker, part of the admin team, and I'm also uh, doing a lot of work with Wi Fi access point vendors. And we came across these new FCC regulations. Uh, which apparently nobody has heard of. It's like, ah, oh, someone made these new regulations and told no nobody about it. It's not that bad, but I think it's probably something new to some of you. And uh, yeah, it, I think it will be troubling for us, for our community networks. So let's see what this is about. Um, the structure of uh, today's discussion is I, I will tell you something about the regulations from what I understand and what happened so far and after that we will have an open discussion with everyone um, to see yeah, what you think, what your experiences are and what we can do about that. Alright, um, so basically the FCC is uh, the main certification authority if you um, want to um, sell a device in the United States. So if you want to sell an access point uh, in the uh, United States, you have to get FCC approval um, to sell it. Then you get a little number, you, you do a couple of tests, and then they will approve it, and you can sell it, and yeah, that's the idea. So uh, that's um, a little bit different from uh, EU, so that's actually only valid for the US. Um, yeah, but the uh, US market is pretty big and um, also there are a lot of trade agreements. So for example, if you have uh, finished approval for the FCC and you want to sell your device, for example, in Brazil or Mexico or other countries, uh, then you only have to um, do a, only a little test to be able to sell it. Right. Um, so if, once you have that FCC approval, you can also sell it in, in other countries, not the EU, but a couple of others. This is actually the DFS world map, which is not completely accurate. So China obviously does a lot of own stuff, but for North America and parts of South America, that's definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's that's taken from the regulation database from the Linux kernel. So. Okay, yeah. So, as I already said, um, FCC has a uh, yeah, wider circle of where it affects people than only the US. And if Asian vendors or vendors in general need to lock down their firmware, uh, then not only the US market will be affected, but also the EU market most probably, because the vendors will not just make a different hardware version for the US and don't lock down the EU, I don't think that will happen. So we should probably think about that. Um, so what happened? Um, the FCC updated the rules last year uh, for uh, different kind of devices, also Wi-Fi access points. And we will uh, see what these rules are about later in a minute. And basically, until uh, June 1st, you could still certify uh, your devices under the old rules. And after that, uh, you have to use the new rules to certify your devices. And after June next year, you are not even allowed to market uh, devices which are only certified under the old rules. So you have either have to recertify or you have to stop. Uh, marketing them. Marketing means you can't put them on your website and your online shop or whatever. You can still sell them, I think, but you, yeah, it's like more or less banning the, these uh, devices. Um, there's currently also an open um, commenting uh, thing for, uh, going on from the FCC. I'm not completely sure about that date. But this is like, um, yeah, next week or in two weeks, uh, where uh, the public can file 
their opinion to the FCC and maybe it will get considered. So um, if US people want to get active, that might be a good thing to, to work on. All right, so what does the FCC want to do? Um, their idea is to prevent normal users like accidentally using wrong channels, use too high transmission powers, um, prevent uh, using DFS channels uh, without actually having DFS. So DFS is um, uh, the dynamic frequency selection. We had a talk last year about that. Um, basically, if you see a radar or some kind of primary user, you should uh, switch to another channel to not disturb that um, primary user. And that's especially relevant for these uh, Doppler weather radars, which are uh, still used on a couple of airports in the US. Um, I think they are using these only as a secondary system, and it's also a legacy, so new uh, weather radars work on a different frequency. Um, but this is how it looks like. So we have some real rain clouds over here. And over Berlin, we have the uh, <laughs> DFS clouds. From the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> That's a map from Germany. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, there are also a couple of others, right? So, so if people use their Wi Fi access points on that frequency and don't move away, uh, they can disturb some of the primary users like that. Um, and this has already been part of the old FCC rules, right? So uh, they also stated um, that vendors should make sure that nobody accidentally uh, does any wrong configuration. And I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, so that's a lot of blah, blah, blah. Uh, we don't have to go over that in detail. But basically what, what they say now is that manufacturers must make sure that they implement some kind of security features to prevent uh, users in any way to uh, change these relevant settings like channel and transmission power and so on to go on uh, not allowed uh, values. So and they, they also talk about authentication, electronic signatures, blah blah blah. Um, they don't really tell you what to do or which technique to employ, but you have to do something. Can you show it again, please? Question. Does it apply to the radio as a whole or only to the wireless radio? Um, so what? The, the question was if these rules apply to the whole router or only the wireless portion mm -hmm. and it applies to the whole router because you certify the whole router. Um, so you uh, certify one device as a whole, um, but you can technically divide your radio from your host CPU to uh, prevent that people fiddle with the radio part. This is actually how cell phone works, so they usually have a baseband processor. Uh, which is as a well hidden firmware, and uh, usually, if you update your Android device, you only update the host. Mm -hmm. I'm asking because many, in many cases, the actual radio part uh, in the Wi-Fi router is attached to uh, many PCI cards. Um, well, I, I think most of the devices, also what we use here, uh, use SOCs, where all of that is on one. Also, the uh, WDR 4300, which we deploy here, they are also use Qualcomm SOCs where everything is on one chip and there's no separation. But yeah, even uh, if we also talk about Qualcomm PCI Express cards, for which we use ATH9K, there's no special firmware on them, but they are completely controlled uh, from the whole CPU and technically you can do many interesting things. It was generally my hope when this issue started coming up that the overall solution of the signed registration database <coughs> built into every one of would actually address this. 
So my question is, is to what extent um, has these concerns been outlined in a letter or some communication with the FCC? Uh, I, I don't really get that question. <laughs> but has a letter of complaint or clarification filed with the FCC? I don't know. I, I, I've seen an open comment section. This is also what I was referring to earlier, and there have been a couple of complaints, like four or five from private people, like, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. So but, I'm, I'm, but I'm not aware of any public complaints. So a way forward on this is for the open source developers of the world and the open source users of the world to write that, right? That's probably a good idea, I guess. So uh, actually, when when I announced the talk, there was quite a bit of uh, buzz, and uh, so people tweeted about that and put it on Reddit just because we had it uh, in the agenda. And then pe uh, various people contacted me and others, also from the Free Software Foundation, uh, Foundation and EFF, and they are. Uh, in the middle of forming a mailing list to connect up these people and to uh, think about a strategy how to counter them. But as, I, but as I said, this is actually not new. They already started that last year. Just nobody noticed, I guess. <laughs> and now v vendors have, have to certify and they are like, ah, how do we do that? So, yeah. Yeah, obviously this affects different hardware designs differently. Like traditionally when speaking about Wi-Fi, um, there used to be a differentiation uh, between full Mac and soft Mac cards or uh, Wi-Fi interfaces. Uh, whereas the um, full Mac uh, systems come with their own uh, built-in microcontroller and microcontroller firmware, just like the newer version of Qualcomm Aetheros um, 8211AC capable hardware, which is just built like that. Just like the Marvel um, based Wi-Fi you would find in the very expected Linksys device we spoke about before. Um, but for soft Mac, this is all done in the driver. So the question really falls down to uh, whether the Wi-Fi interface is considered to be a device on its own, or if that's just an electronic component. I'm aware of EU regulation where if you import uh, mini PCI Wi-Fi cards, these are not considered to be uh, radio transmitting systems, but electronic components. And only if you put them into a laptop or into a router, that makes it a device. Mm -hmm. So you can work with really and um, bypass all regulations by just importing the parts separately. Um, yeah. But I can I can see that. Um, Possibly some of the vendors we, or our chips we see today, uh, were aware of that change to happen, and uh, the most popularly, uh, Quarkum Aetherus, which was previously the best or most popular producer of soft Mac chips, changed to a full Mac design, and I think it, this design change must have been, they must have been aware of this something like four years ago for stuff to hit the market now. Well, I, I think one. Uh, one of the major drivers for the decision was also performance, um, but yeah, it, it might also be part of that actually. So, if we uh, um, this is rough, uh, it feels like I work in that field, so I can maybe give you something to So the FTC, what they're basically doing is they're changing their point of view. So they don't care soft bag, a full bag, whatever. They just for you. Want to sell your device, you have to certify for the US market. They ask the question, well, how do you make sure that nobody can change the video channels you type in the screen or or a DFS, why not DFS? They don't care about software or like anything. So all this AD change, this stuff that you just mentioned is totally underneath. Because the Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi router manufacturer in the end, whether it's 8 k or 10K, just has to prove to the FCC how they prevent any user from, you know, when they sell this device, from um, changing, you know, to the legal, uh, whatever they can say. Actually, I, I think uh, we have an open discussion section after that, so uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, let's just go through a couple of slides and then we can discuss our content, all right?
so uh, yeah, I think we already covered that. Um, so on, on one hand, there's the rules, and on the other hand, there's a guidance document, uh, which is a couple of questions, two pages. I only have one of them here, and they ask vendors a couple of things so they can more easily explain how they prevent their stuff. And one very interesting change which happened, uh, I think, March this year is uh, that over here. I will read that. Um, so what prevents third parties from loading non-US versions of the software slash firmware on the device? Describe in detail how the device is protected from flashing and the installation of third-party firmware such as DDWRT. So that's like that's so, concerning, yes. so that's like vendors should explain how they prevent that you can uh, install DDWRT or OpenWRT firmware on that device. I would love to see how Buffalo deal with that. Huh? Buffalo ships DDWRT. <laughs> yeah, so I also it's SDK is open directly. It's just that you can't flash it what they do it. There are quite a couple of companies who also ship open directly based devices. Yeah. Well, my answer to this is to produce a prototype device from somebody, file with your FCC for approval of it, and see what happens. Yeah, if you have the money, you can try. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, just an, another small comment, this is not only affecting Wi-Fi access points, but also other devices which use Wi-Fi uh, can use access point mode, like phone and tablets. Uh, I have not seen so much discussion about that yet, but that's actually a bigger, uh, yeah, a bigger market. Right, okay, so basically uh, this is where the open discussion starts now. Um, I have a couple of questions which I personally would be interested in, like what are your experience with recently certified Wi-Fi hardware, like have you seen any devices which have been locked down? Um, how can we still keep open WRT on these devices and especially what can we suggest hardware vendors to keep their firmware open for the community and maybe still comply? Or alternatively, how we can get active? Um, there's an Everpad over here, which I would like to, uh, you to log in, and at least one of you please take notes, so we can have something for the other people, because I would like to share that with uh, all the people who emailed me on that topic. All right. Um, so, yeah, please, there were some uh, questions. Well, I think still, when I hear this kind of comments, that a soldering chip will not require to lock down the Linux operation system because you could just under the FCC, yes, as a soldering chip, it has its own, so I have my own firmware for Wi Fi. I have, I have the user has no way of changing the setting for the firmware of Wi Fi. So you can easily uh, put DDWRT on it.
Yeah, well, this might be quite exceptional in 2.4 gigahertz. This, this situation is very, very common in 5 gigahertz, where you have nearly no overlap in uh, allowed uh, channel usage worldwide. And uh, what we saw when this GUI was basically that, um, like TP-Link, for example, just sets one bit in their marker ID, and they have these two bits, which are for the four different markets they're currently supplied to. And um, so all the firmware, if you want it runs a firmware which has which was flashed by TP-Link, for example, for a certain target market, this firmware will just make sure that the single bits are set in the same way, which is obviously not uh, enough to uh, comply with these regulations, which would require some kind of code signing, um, which can be found in format chips. The firmware of format chips uh, recently uh, starts to incorporate code signing currently, so which is less of an impact if you just want to play with routing, but it's more of an impact if you want to use these devices as software you can play with as well. Strong point that I would like to make with the FCC is that in my view, when most Wi-Fi firmware is broken, it's not dangerous to continue to be used and updated. Yeah, so one of the concerns other people had was security. Like, if, if you buy a device with stock firmware, and we have all seen the news, like, after three months, there's some really bad security bug, and if you are not allowed to change it on your own, and the vendor doesn't supply a patch, then you are... Throw it away and buy a new one from the same yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> Right, of course. Vendors control the life cycle back. <laughs> you know, let us not use these devices after their end of life cycle, that's about it. <laughs> I almost lack like words to say how pissed off I am by this shit. We <laughs> live <laughs> the effort of software defined radios, and they can be purchased easily and everywhere. And uh, if you buy some electronic gear, it doesn't matter whether there's an FCC stamp on it or not. You can turn it on anyway, but it would be illegal. So, this is to totally anachronistic. This is like the multimedia industry uh, fighting the digitalization of the media. Same, same problem here. Yeah. Reminds me of TV player country clubs. Popular around the country Can you uh, show us the slide where the uh, the law is written down what the vendors have to do. Okay. Because if I read this correctly, um, there is not a must to have signed images. No. Uh, but then, uh, but then, so they can do it. But uh, the question to the audience is: uh, Does uh, does anybody know devices? which are using signed images. Because I think it's um, not easy to do this for vendors. Uh, of course it is possible, but um, I think nobody does it. But at least uh, we know it from uh, smartphones. Uh, uh, I think there are smartphones which are also devices which are regulated by the FCC. Um, and I think they are using signed uh, the firmware images. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I have no deep knowledge of this, but uh, uh, is it possible to circumvent this on smartphones? Well, yeah. So, so one point is the FCC does not require any special technique what to do. So if you have some other means to prevent something, you can, probably can do that. And also, uh, what is important in the end is not the question about the guidance document, but to comply with the rules. So if, if you come up with your own explanation and people accept that, that would be okay. For that reason, I was hoping that maybe we can have a technical workaround to still uh, make the FCC accept the devices and uh, still be able to use OpenWRT if, if we want, but that seems kind of difficult. So maybe someone has a good idea. Uh, the other 
point uh, you made is it's right that many smartphones use some kind of code signing and they try to prevent locking out people, but hackers <laughs> often get the way very fast to still update the phone. So maybe at that point the FCC uh, accepted it because it like looks reasonably secure and then it's not. So that could also be something which we can recommend. Do some security mechanisms which look good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, uh, yeah, that's also a hacked solution. Yeah, so, I think the, the main answer to your question, I think it's very different depending on where code sign is actually implemented. Um, if we take it and compare it to what we saw with UEFI happening on common PCs, this is code signing implemented already on the lower server levels, like inside the lowest levels of food order, and we have a physical class anchor and some crypto to check. Um, now, this is nowhere to be found in, in wireless routers or wireless devices, as far as I know. But what you do find is a high level embedded image space software which, which has a web based interface. And if you want to flash further through that web based interface, that will actually check a RSA signature or um, have a bias, uh, a bias a CRC or a sample which is not a very hard to circumvent cryptographic technique, but uh, at least some effort was made there and it's quite common to find. Um, Vendors also made some uh, effort to prevent uh, flashing the device on the loader level, um, usually by just disabling the zero console, so you can access the loader anymore. And there are a couple of devices, um, recent devices, uh, with software-defined radio Wi-Fi chips, which uh, do incorporate such techniques. Um, okay. Do you have any specific examples of this? Um, yes, there's a company called Sayomi, which is Currently, uh, one out of three available um, devices is supported by OpenWRT, which uh, support 802.11ac, which is the new fast Wi-Fi and 5 gigahertz. And um, they use MediaTek's chipset, which is a software-defined uh, chip like SoftMac. So, um, Xiaomi basically, in order to, we got some <coughs> devices here, and in order to be uh, able to flash a firmware on it, register on Sayami's website, have the device call home and get permission so it will unlock the Google or you can actually flash something. So what they do is basically they lock it down and if you show them that you're not inside the FCC regulation domain, they would then afterward unlock it so you can flash it. Okay. But it still, uh, um, say, it still makes it very dependent on their goodwill and they will probably only support that during the active marketing time of the device and they will stop no. mentioning the device on their website once they stop marketing it, obviously. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So I was going to ask about exactly that. Does the FCC allow uh, manufacturers to have a mechanism to basically say, I know what I'm doing, I'm not going to break the law, please let me flash my device, um, which is a mechanism, I should say, similar to yeah. what you just described. Often found in smartphones, like most smartphones, also don't allow you flashing firmware. But how would any software developer develop anything for these devices? Um, um, so, exactly. what they basically do is you have some kind of developer registration on the vendor's website, and then they would give you some unknown code which would allow you to have full order access. Yeah, and, 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 and which is still horrible. I'm doing it wrong. It's still horrible. My reading of this is not clear whether or not that would be allowed under these rules, um, but. If it is, that would be a way forward to at least have some way of still flashing it. Because if this is as tight as the worst case reading of this, um, we're not going to be able to flash open word unless we break whatever the effect is. Mm -hmm. I think smartphones are a bad example here because in most smartphones, I know at least from the Android part, yeah, you can easily flash a new firmware, but I think there's not a single one where you can flash your own basement. They all have these two architectures, and most times the security the power in the, around the basement chip is much higher for the terms of putting your own software there. The software might still be horribly insecure. But this is similar to, the, to this full Mac design. The problem is that the full Mac chip on this level is most likely more expensive than the system on chip, which has a single CPU and everything integrated. 
So it might be a solution for the 100 euro router, but if we're looking for the 30 euro or 40 euro device, it might not be possible or might not be feasible to put a full Mac chip with dedicated signed firmware in there. Uh, the, I know that there are some smartphones where you are able to attach also the radio. The There's no source only like binary, only binary and binary matches are going to go to the loops later. Yeah, but that is your paper to attach it. Yeah, so we have some people from Germany. Yeah, Lego. 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 Yeah, uh, can you comment on anything, how your company handles that, if, if that's possible? Actually, Use the microphone, please. Yeah. Is it, is it turned on? Is it turned on? Your voice. So can you come to us in front of us? Or oh, I can go up. <laughs> so you probably hear me now. Yes. Yes. So how we apply currently at your skills, which is new to us also. and frequencies which can be used together with maximum uh, transmit power. Uh, we already are applying the new rules, uh, including the firmware lockdown, but it's only for uh, US-based devices, not Europe one. So basically when you get device from United States, which casually happens in Africa, because Africa people buy from United States, they get a uh, lockdown firmware with US country code. And if they prove that they are from Africa and not uh, United States, we can give them special uh, flash image which unlocks all the country codes, including the compliance testing country code which is with unlimited power. Okay. Um, but that means you can still unlock uh, it, uh, but only with some special uh, flash file you have. Um, but for the US devices, it is not possible to flash OpenWRT anymore? Or? Currently it's possible, I guess, because we've shown how to flash it. Okay. But Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I have one idea which might work uh, if we would provide SDK with lockdown country code United States uh, we would follow still FCC rules for the transmit power and you would have possibility to enter your uh, routing protocols and so on mm -hmm. but you wouldn't uh, you would be legal with FCC transmit powers and so on so SDK is probably one of the ways mm -hmm. But for the uh, DDWRT question, uh, which we had in the slides, you would actually have to answer, yes, it is possible to flash DDWRT or something else, right? Yeah. So, okay. Good. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you got that through. I would guess that the special flash file to get your own software on this device specifically. Right, because otherwise it would already be out of the open. Someone could come and get it. So, so there's no accidentally releasing the tool because this would cause a cost with the regulation. Compliance. Okay, but uh, how, how does that request process work? Like, we have to email you if you want to do that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, maybe it would be possible to, to uh, circumvent that somehow. I, uh, I already have one. Yeah, take that, sorry. <laughs> like, uh, if we have a way.
web page where you can request that for your MAC address and it checks for your geolocation or something. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise emailing it uh, for every single device. If you're, I, know, I know a couple of vendors who use access points and flash them and sell them and hotspot. Like they have 10 to 20 devices per day. They will send you a lot of emails. <laughs> but Okay. Will it be possible? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was thinking if the WeWeb model could be the human, if you keep the, the kernel on the drive and you have all the rest of the drive on the drive. So you are stuck with the old Wi-Fi driver? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, but personally, I, I would not like that. Maybe no, it works. Oh, no, we have yeah. another box in Wi-Fi driver. So. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Batman, yes. <laughs> we haven't used this discussion is going to be in Europe also, because normally what bad news here generated in the US then we acquired them in Europe, so anything like that? So, yeah, I'm, I haven't heard about anything. So in Europe we have Etsy who make the rules and so far they have uh, uh, similar requirements which we had earlier, so you have to make sure that a normal user cannot just oops, like transmission power to maximum if it's a uh, high power device. Uh, but I haven't heard anything so far about digital signing and stuff. But uh, I'm also not following that all the time. It's more like if I'm in discussion with the vendor and they say, ah, there's the new rules, we have to comply, how we do that? Is it, is it possible that if we're reading these, uh, these lines from the FCC in kind of an alarmist way and it is more of a Suggestion to make it foolproof, you know, bumping something up to the maximum power, like you said, not disallowing it, but just making it something that can't be accidentally done. I've seen a lot of FCC rules, and I've seen a lot of language come from the FCC that seems to be very nuanced, and it 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 doesn't seem like the FCC often. Somebody jump on me for this, but it doesn't seem like the FCC wants to be the enemy, right? They want to work with the community. They were very close with the ham radio community. So, is it alarmist to look at these rules and, and say, oh, they're going to lock it down? Is it more of, well, they're trying to make it a better environment, a wireless environment for us to work with? Yeah, I, I think that they only have, uh, yeah positive intentions <laughs> and they already had um, in the past they already had these uh, rules that you should not show the slider as, as we just discussed so so that we already had but there must have been quite a few cases where people just buy stuff install DDWRT and as far as I've heard there was some special kind of license for DDWRT which you just install and then you ha uh, can uh, turn off DFS uh, have this slide, which is very easy. Uh, that's only rumors, so I didn't uh, yeah, verify that. But if that's true, and many thousand people did that, then this is their bureaucratic response uh, how, how to deal with that. But on the other hand, that, uh, as I'm afraid, this would lock down um, the general usage of uh, free firmware, and um, yeah, I think they, they went a little bit too far with that. I think the DDWRT question is pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, there's not so much room for interpretation. Yeah. In my they explicitly talk about flashing with DDWRT, so it seems to be 
one of the issues why they updated the rules. They would not put. Can you repeat that, please? They put the name DDVRT into their into their FAQ. So they are, I don't think this is the, this is one of the reasons why they updated the rules. So there's a, and I think there's no chance in hell that they'll be just misinterpreting this and. <coughs> They think there's a widespread problem that people are ignoring these regulations, and they say one of the sources of this widespread problem is custom firmware, which is easy enough to install that everyone who can read the web page and do two mouse clicks can get. So they want a solution. They don't necessarily want to lock down the whole firmware. They, if someone presents a better solution, they, they most likely would accept it, but they want the current status shifting toward a more compliant area because it got too widespread. Right. Actually, one of the intentions of the FCC or what their own guidelines are is to uh, um, allow people to have full control over their devices for security and other reasons. This is one of the guidelines, as far as I heard from the FCC, and this is like. Uh, internal uh, blocker or uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, we interrupted you. You want to say something else? Um, <laughs> what I also um, notice is it's not clear in the guidelines uh, whether they are you must do this and this and this and this and this in order to comply, or whether doing How many of these recommendations must you follow in order to probably be compliant? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not clear from that document. No, it, it, it is not clear, but I would guess you have to positively answer these questions. So. Uh, <laughs> And as FCC applications are happening in public, you can just go to the FCC's website and like, check all the devices which got, uh, which yes. were seen as to be compliant during the last month, and that should answer that question pretty much. All FCC applications, including all added in documents, which a lot of information are public. I know that because that's my main source for information when reverse engineering devices and I want to see photos of the board before actually opening it. I go to the FCC's website, type in the FCC ID, which is usually on the bottom of the place, and you know that gives you already a lot of information. You can see like what the vendor is actually hand in and what was their answer. So I think Yeah, I think they are allowed to keep some of it secret, but do you know if they have these kind of explanations uh, also? Uh, added to the public database? Uh, I haven't checked uh, recently, but okay. I probably that's the next thing I'll do. Yeah, we should do that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, maybe uh, somebody of you is more involved into uh, hacking uh, uh, signed images. Um, so the question is, uh, is it possible to buy some uh, uh, time in a data center to crack a key? So because um, we are a community, so if uh, we buy some CPU hours, so it should be easily possible to, uh, to get a private key or a TP link. Isn't it? Because we have seen that uh, for all the, all the stuff out there, we now will be now I, I, the private keys. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be easier if you just lease a helicopter and go to China, just keep <laughs> killing and get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> really it's, that? Yes, that's like, I don't think they use so short key lengths yeah. to just yeah. break it. They don't think we should. Yeah, we can maybe exploit problems in the implementation of the signature mechanism. It has been done in the past, it can be done in the future, but things get better because they get more common and there will be libraries for vendors to do this. Cracking the asymmetric cryptography, I think there are some organizations with a lot more money <laughs> than, than our community mesh networks that would like to do so. And we think they did 
not to succeed. So if we can buy up a few hours of time to crack some LSA 2050, or maybe a little bit curved key, then I think we could do a lot more things and we should not worry about router security anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree and, and anyway what, what we don't want also as a community is like uh, arm up on both sides so like what, what we really want to do is have the solution maybe we really miss it to print piece or maybe there is some kind of workaround through the text so we can make a proper device I'm not sure on, on the other hand we can do the FCC filings I think uh, oops it's locked uh, but we have it on the other pad, there's a um, link to the, um, to the public file. It's uh, FCC docs, ah, but changed quite a lot. <laughs> I have to check. Um, maybe, no, it's not the second one, but, but there was, <laughs> and if it's not, we can add it. Um, yeah, so, so maybe also, especially the US people over here should send uh, an email and it is as easy as sending an email to them, explaining your situation and why you think it's wrong. Let this recognition at the art, then we can have something about the fact that it doesn't Yeah, but there's um, SDR and non-SDR. Uh, regulations which are different from each other and there was some discussion where these both have mixed uh, so there are definitely different regulations but um, yeah well, one last comment please because I think everyone is hungry mm -hmm. just yes. is it on? Yes. 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 the new sentence says you can not be able to read the right? and you are right yes and you can only get over it to some emails and channels. And channels. If you move that as far away from the domain of the reprogramming, Yes. It has a lot of other negative implications. Yeah, but what can we do? This is the only thing we have. Yeah, even if you want to sell the old Qualcomm FRS chips, which allow the software to make all these changes when you have to lock down the whole thing. I guess. So, um, it's not possible to separate. No. Uh, uh, maybe it is, but I, I don't know how. If anyone comes up with something clever, I would be very interested. Um, I, I think we should stop that now because Musi was telling us there's food outside and I'm hungry. I don't know. <laughs> Let's probably move the discussion to the lunch. Yeah. Or after the lunch. Or so, thank you very much for your attention. We can also do. So we can use the mailing list to discuss, there will be another mailing list for that topic specifically and you can use the Everpad.